When it comes to air quality, the bad news is that wildfires and air pollution have really degraded the quality of our air. But the good news is that we're all realizing that the quality of our air, and particularly the quality of our indoor air, is really darn important. I'm so excited to tell you about Puro Air because in 30 minutes, this device will remove allergens, dust, smoke, and gases from your room. It uses a stronger type of filter called a HEPA-14, and it filters pollutants at a microscopic level. I keep my Puro Air running upstairs where the bedrooms are all night. I love that it's quiet. Cleaner air just hits different, doesn't it? Check out everything Puro Air has to offer at getpuroair.com. That's G-E-T-P-U-R-O-A-I-R.com. One more time for the people in the back, getpuroair.com. Well, hello there, my friends, and welcome back. You're listening to episode 452 of Sustainable Minimalists. This is a show about intentional and eco-friendly minimalist living. On today's show, we are identifying those universal truths, those house rules, if you will, that apply to every house, every style, every budget, every size. Now, real quick, before we get into today's content, a humongous thank you to all of you who stepped up this weekend and became supporters of this show. You have reinvigorated me. You have relit that fire in me that was going out, to be honest. And I want to thank all of you publicly. If you receive benefit from this show, please ask yourself, how much benefit? Do you get $5 a month worth of benefit from this podcast? If so, I ask you to please consider becoming a supporter. Your support means that I don't have to be a slave to brands and their demands and their advertisements. Your support means I can focus my efforts on making you happy with the best content possible instead of making brands happy and chasing their money. Now let's get back to today's show, today's content. Today's show is so good. We're discussing exactly how to make havens out of our homes. Our homes aren't just for resting and sleeping, right? Your home is your home base. And if your home's doing what it's supposed to be doing, it's providing you with a sense of belonging, with comfort, with security, with stability. And that's precisely because your home, whether it's gigantic or tiny or decorated to the nines or bare as bones, your home is that space where you're creating memories, you're acquiring wisdom, you're expressing your true self, you're taking off that mask that we all, to some extent, wear around others, right? And so when we're talking about decluttering or interior design or any other means by which we're curating our space, it's not just about aesthetics. It's about providing the foundation for which you and every other person in your home can self-actualize, can reach their full potential. Today, I am speaking with New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestselling author Michael and Smith about creating a beautiful and livable home when you're feeling stuck. Mike Willen comes to our conversation armed with those universal design truths that you can implement in your home immediately and then get back to that important business of living. Now, the house rules that we're discussing today come straight from Mike Willen's new book. It's titled House Rules, How to Decorate for Every Home Style and Budget. It comes out April 23rd. And a quick reminder, everyone, if you are a supporter of this show for $5 a month, you get an extended and ad-free version of my conversation with Mike Willen today. And oh my goodness, it's a good one. Mike Willen, I'm so thrilled to have you on the show. How are you? Well, hello. I'm great. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. I'm so excited to talk to you about your new book. I believe it's your fourth book, House Rules. There are a hundred of them. We can't get to all a hundred today, but we're going to get to some. My first question for you is just a silly one. Have you ever broken one of your house rules? And if so, tell us about it. I've probably broken every single one of the house rules. You know, the first rule in my book 
is that you learn the rules so that you can break the rules. So I feel like I've pretty much made every mistake in decorating that you can make. And there's a quote from Andrew Peterson. He says, you know, he writes for creatives. He's a songwriter. Um, and he says, you have to earn the right to break the rules, which is why I like the name House Rules, even though I'm not a rule girl at all. But I feel like, especially in any creative endeavor, we want to break the rules because we believe what we're doing is going to look better in decorating, not because we don't know better. And I think that's the difference of breaking a rule with confidence and breaking the rule because you're ignorant. And I broke many rules in the past because I was ignorant. Things like painting my room before I settled on a sofa. You know, you paint your room with a $60 can of paint, and now that's the boss of what color sofa you can get. So much easier to get your expensive item first. Get the sofa first. (laughs) Then out of the plethora of paint colors, you can choose the exact shade that you want to go with your sofa instead of the other way around, for example. Okay, see, that's really helpful for me as somebody who, you know, I want my house to look nice, but I'm not trained as an interior designer. I would assume you paint the walls first, but you're telling me to buy the sofa first. Do I have that right? I am. But, you know, the order of decor, I I think for so long, we've all been kind of duped by the whole decorating thing. Like we think decorating is supposed to be easy and fun. And some people were born with a decorating gene and I wasn't. Oh, well. I want to dispel all of those myths. They are lies. And it's my job to tell you that no one is born with a decorating gene. There are some people that were able to practice their passion in life earlier than other people. For me, it was decorating. When I was 15, instead of like going to football games and having fun with my friends, I was on a Saturday night in my room, moving my furniture around, spraying pressed flowers to my walls, which I'm sure my mom loved that moving my furniture, reading Martha Stewart magazine. Like I did that when I was young, when I was playing Barbies, I would design houses. So I got to learn the, the universal decorating truths without there being any consequences, without spending $2,000 on a sofa. I was learning that just for fun. Those are the people that we say were born with it. And the thing with those people is because you learn early, you don't even think about the rules. You don't, you just, You just got them. They're in here. But for the rest of us, we feel like, well, we never learned that. So it's a big mystery. But just like anything in life, decorating is simply a skill that you can learn. And it's about making decisions in the right order. So yes, you paint. Paint is step four. So let's say you're thinking about your um, dining room. Well, first you say, is it fully serving its purpose? Are we using it? What activities need to happen in here? And for how many people? And so once you think about that, I want you to create a Pinterest board for that room and you just pin with abandon any rooms that feel right when you think about your dining room. You don't pin only dining rooms with carpet if yours has carpet or only dining rooms with white walls if you're, no, this is to get a sense of where you're headed, what you're passionate about, what you're excited about. Um, From then, you quiet your room, you empty out as much as you can, you live your leave your big pieces of furniture. And the step two is to get your seating, your surfaces and your storage in place. So those are like the functional items. And sometimes we realize, oh, I have a family of five, and I only have two chairs in my family room. Well, that's a pretty big, you know, you want your family to have a place to sit. That's a pretty important thing. And so this order of decor also gives us a hierarchy of like, what to focus on first, maybe where to even invest our money. Because if you don't have seating and if you also don't have artwork, well, it's more important to have seating than art. So that hierarchy helps us know. So we get our seating, our surfaces, and our storage in. Most of us actually have that. Uh, And then from then we do uh, step three, which is we call it the homey trinity. It's your rugs, your drapes, and your lighting. That is the secret that so many homes are missing. We skip that. I skipped it for years, but it is the secret to adding coziness without adding a layer of clutter to our surfaces at a big rug. If you're a pattern person, it can be pattern. If you're a neutral person, it can be neutral. Um, And your furniture layout will dictate and inform how big your rug is and where it goes. It's like this beautiful system that falls easily into place when you make your decisions in the right order, because once you get your, say your sofa and a couple of chairs in your family room and, and you move them around, you live with them for a few days and you figure out exactly where you want them. 
Then you want to make sure that the front feet of your sofa and your primary seating are all on the rug. So that's how you know how big your rug should be. So it, it kind of makes logical sense. From there, we do um, your drapes. We evaluate if you want drapes. I love window treatments that are soft because, again, they add that coziness. Our rooms don't echo without adding stuff to our surfaces. And then lastly is our lighting, lamps. Like America is missing lamps. We have one overhead light per room. And let me tell you, it is the secret to a cozy space. You can have like eight lamps in a room. You just layer them. Pockets of this warm, cozy light will be wonderful. After that, now we're at walls. So now we do wall art, wall Sabbaths. Do you know it's okay to have nothing on some of your walls? And then wall treatments, paint, wallpaper, whatever it is. And then lastly, it's accessories. Okay, I'm talking your head off. Moving on. That's the order of decor. No, I love it. I mean, it sounds so easy when you say it. And I'm wondering, well, why is it so hard for me? But I think my problem comes into place with regard to the fact that for me and perhaps many of my listeners as well, we've inherited these, let's just say, heirloom pieces. Like for me, I have a lot of really old, antique, um, valuable, passed down from generations, oriental rugs. And so from from what I hear you saying, the rugs aren't until I believe step three, but like those have to go in first because of the um, heirloom quality to them. So what would you say to me and listeners like me who have this stuff that absolutely must stay? You're saying they're staying. And I think that's totally fine. Like some people have a special piece of art and they're like, this is like a painting I had commissioned of my kids. You are allowed to work out of order as long as you are okay with the piece bossing that you're working out of order. If you love your heirloom rugs, then wonderful. Let it be in there first. The problem comes when we um, are letting someone decorate for us who has gifted up pieces that we don't love. So then we're like, well, that's help me get my style, but I hate these pieces and I have to use them. I can't really help someone. You, if I, Do you love your rugs? I'm guessing you do. They sound beautiful. I do love my rugs, but to your point, I also have big, bulky mahogany furniture that's been passed down for me from the 50s and 60s. I took these items, especially speaking about the dining room, because they're quality. And they are. They're absolutely quality. But they're heavy. They're dark. They're this. They're that. So t- tell me what I should do. I definitely think that a lot of times we can make things work together. I am getting a sense that you're not happy with those together. So I would say, first and foremost, the, listen, the goal is for you to love your room, not to get your room in a magazine. So if you wanted, you could sell them on Facebook Marketplace. And probably for that exact amount of money, you could buy secondhand quality pieces on Facebook Marketplace, you know, give yourself a month or so, and you can switch it out. Making changes in your home is trouble. It will have a cost. The cost will either be money, it will be time, it will be uh, having conversations with your partner and deciding together. It could be DIYing something. There's always a cost. It's always trouble. But if we are at a place where like, I'm ready for a change, then I think you're asking the right questions, which is people have given me these pieces. I'm grateful for them because they're well made. But the people that come to me don't just want to own things that are well-made. We want to own things, and I love well-made things, but everyone that listens to me is because we also want to love the way our home looks, not so we can be impressive. Like no one's ever said, I want to make my sister-in-law feel bad, and I want to have a show-off home. But what it is, is when we love our home, when it feels like us, we use it. And when we don't, we don't volunteer to have the baby shower. We're distracted because we hate the way our room looks. We don't want to have anyone over. And that's when it's a problem. And I don't care if your furniture is from the King of England. If it makes you not happy with your home and if you're not using it, I say it's time to make a change. Something you said there really struck me. Like if we're not feeling good about our homes and if we don't want to have people over, that's where we can really start to impact our own well-being and wellness, right? We're more isolating ourselves. Perhaps it's time to make the space feel better for us. 
as a means of improving our own well-being. It's not just about aesthetics. It's about well-being, I think is what I hear you saying there. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's the whole side eye that people get like, oh, you keep changing your house. You must be so ill content. Like, no, it's like environment is the invisible hand that shapes human behavior. And I think we all believe that's true. We have all gone maybe to someone's home that was a mess and chaotic and uncomfortable and it smelled weird and there was no place to sit. We just wanted to get out of there. And then we've also gone to people's homes where they have welcomed us in. There's a place to set our coffee. They got us a little snack. They welcomed us into their family room. There's a comfy place to sit down by a window with the fire going and a lamp on. And we sit facing each other in comfy swirly chairs. And it wasn't that their house was perfect or impressive or expensive, but it was like they had created an atmosphere, an environment that was conducive to connection. They enjoyed that, whether they were alone, whether they had 100 people over, whether they had one person over. Creating home is about creating an environment for ourselves, for our family, for our friends. And I think that is so worthwhile. I love that. And I'll just say too, uh, the flip side can also be true. You know, like when I, in my own life, go to people's houses, I'm invited over for coffee or maybe dinner or this or that. I'm actually not so much looking at their home as experiencing the feeling of being invited somewhere, right? And connecting with someone. So for people who are listening and are thinking, oh, I never have anybody over because I feel like they're always nitpicking. They're likely not. They're likely just excited to be out of their own house and connecting with you. So don't let the state of your house stop you from inviting people over, I think is really important to say. Like, more people, more connection. But I have to talk to you about some of your rules. I made a laundry list. I need your insight and wisdom in no particular order. If it's okay with you, I'd like to talk about some of them. Does that sound good? Yeah. All right. The first one, because this is a show about minimalism, rule 80, threes, please. Now, I think I know what you're going to say here, but I'm going to let you take it away and then I'm going to give my thoughts. Rule 80, threes, please. It's just an old (laughs) decorators trick, not from decorators who are old, but it's, you know, we've all heard some version of this. A lot of times people will say, how do I mix woods in a a room? How do I mix metals in a room? Or why does my coffee table vignette look off? And, you know, everything that we use in our home to decorate with is in a relationship. And so a three is sets of threes are like this natural balance that feels good to the human brain. And so if you want to mix metals, you want to mix it or sprinkle it three places in a room. If you're using chrome and brass, you know, three little places each. So it makes it look like you are saying, I am doing this on purpose, not on accident. Same with mixing woods. Same if you are um, maybe styling your coffee table or putting styling pillows on a sofa instead of just one, which just looks like an accident or two, which just feels a little bit unartistic. Something happens and, you know, I, I can't explain it, but it does. When you just add one more, it's like the whole outfit formula. They're like a a top, a bottom, and like a layer. You know how we say that? So it's the same idea of that threes is really what makes it feel complete. So I never knew about this rule of threes, but it goes far beyond interior decoration. I actually learned about the rule of threes. It was in a book about arguing. It's called Win Every Argument. And the book is about you know, you're debating somebody, not arguing, not getting angry, but just like trying to get your point across. Excellent book, by the way. I'll link to it in the show notes. Not about anything we're talking about today, but but one of the techniques for winning your debate or or winning your argument, let's say, is to provide three examples. So the earth is round because don't just give one reason. It's not enough. Two's not enough. And four is overkill. Three is the magic number. And I think about back to my days as a teacher. What is a five-paragraph essay? It's three examples, right? It's an intro, three examples, and an ending. And so I encourage my listeners to just think about all the ways in which the rule of threes, so putting three things together, is the perfect number. We're going to take our quick sponsor break, but then I want to go on to rule number five, because again, this is a sustainability show. Resourcefulness is the ultimate resource. We're going to go there after a quick sponsor 
break. So many of us have chaotic closets that are crammed full of clothing items, and yet somehow we still have nothing to wear. Well, upgrading to high quality and affordable pieces from Quince when you need them is a game changer. They offer organic cotton sweaters and washable silk tops. My 100% Mongolian cashmere sweaters are my go-to. Not only are they affordable, but the quality is top-notch. They wear better than the cashmere sweaters that are double their price. Indulge in affordable luxury. Go to quince.com slash sustainable podcast for free shipping on your order and 365 day returns. Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash sustainable podcast to get free shipping and 365 day returns. One more time, quince.com slash sustainable podcast. Hello, Sustainable Minimalist listeners. Are you committed to living a greener and simpler life? Well, meet Home Threads, your ally in more sustainable and minimalist home decor. As the total destination for decor and furniture, Home Threads helps you define your minimalist lifestyle while respecting the planet. Discover their exclusive Haven collection. They use many sustainable materials without compromising on style. And here's the best part. Home Threads always has the best value. It was time. After nine years of living in our home, it was time to replace our outdoor furniture. And my husband and I, we went to Home Threads. We have a Home Threads patio umbrella and a new bench. And oh my goodness, we are so in love. Create a home that reflects your commitment to the environment. Visit homethreads.com slash sustainable and get a code for 15% off your first order. Homethreads.com slash sustainable. Love where you live. And we're back. Today I'm speaking with Myquillen Smith. She's the author of House Rules, How to Decorate for Every Home, Style, and Budget. She's also known affectionately as The Nester. You can find her at thenester.com. Mike Quillen, we need to go on to rule number five now. I love this. I'm glad it's like one of the first rules. Resourcefulness is the ultimate resource. Take it away. You know, that's actually, I'm sure other people have said it, but to me, it's a famous quote by Tony Robbins. So let's give him credit for that. And I love it because what it says is, we don't have to wait for perfect circumstances to make progress. And I think that means so much to me because I spent a first little chunk of my married life waiting on perfect circumstances to make progress in my home and not understanding that actually at any time I can choose to be resourceful. And from that, that's where the progress comes from. And if I don't recognize that instead of focusing on what I don't have to focus on what I can do, And what we do have, that's where all the good progress uh, can be made. It changes everything. Can you give me an example of rule number five in practice? Um, It's someone who says, I am renting, so therefore, I will wait for my next house to make it pretty. I'm not allowed to make changes. I can't paint my walls. I can't change my uh, chandelier. I hate my carpet. Oh, well, I won't have anyone over. Well, it's true. If you paint your walls, you'll probably lose your deposit. So I I would see you don't want to do that. Um, You could actually change your chandelier and put the old one in the attic, wrap it in a trash bag. Now, if I was living in a place less than a year, I probably wouldn't go to that trouble. But I have changed out my chandeliers before. Uh, If you hate the carpet, you could put a rug down. You don't have to buy the most expensive rug from Serena and Lily. Oh, rugs are $2,000. People will complain. Oh, I can't afford that. It's too much money. Well, things do cost money, but some things just cost time. I found some great pieces of furniture on the side of the road or on free cycle. Did that take time to look at? Absolutely. So it's about changing the perspective from making excuses to saying, oh, you're not telling me I have to go buy all new everything today in order to make progress. There are a thousand ways to make beautiful, meaningful progress in your home if you are willing to look past what you can't do and recognize what you can do. I like that. And I'm thinking about my own home. Like 
my household, our budget does not have wiggle room in it right now to completely redo, let's just say, the dining room. I just said on air, I hate my dining room. Uh, so I don't have the money to like go buy new everything, but I could probably thrift some stuff. I could probably go on my town's uh, buy nothing group and find some stuff that I certainly like and would fit. So I just say that to say for all the listeners who are listening and are like, well, to do a room the right way, it costs tens of thousands of dollars. Maybe if you want to buy everything new and you want to go from ceiling to floor and redo the whole thing. But resourcefulness is the ultimate resource as per rule number five. So just a little reminder to everybody, we don't have to buy everything new and perhaps uh, we don't want to, right? (laughs) So, all right, let's move along. This one is really important to me as a mother of a 10-year-old and a seven-year-old. It's rule number 25. Plan on the kids growing up. I need your wisdom. Give it to me. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you, when I wrote that rule, it was out of frustration from hearing from a few people in my private community about, um, I think just it maybe was a few years ago when lots of people were moving and there's this thing of like, oh, I'm shopping for a new house and I can't buy this house because it's got an upstairs and the kids' rooms are upstairs and Of course, my children are going to be 18 months old for the rest of my life. So therefore, that's going to make my decision. Or I can't put curtains in my home ever because I have children. Or I can't style my coffee table because I have kids. I I think a lot of people blame their kids on why they can't have anything nice. And I raised three boys. They were born within three and a half years of each other. They were rowdy. They rode bikes inside, rollerbladed inside. We made forts. A NASCAR on the table. Now I had a lot of secondhand items as I still do. Um, but we used our house. Our house was not the boss of us. And I taught them respect, but we still were like, our home is a place to have fun and your kids are going to grow up. It's not an excuse. Don't blame your kids. Don't make them the excuse for not making changes in your home. So I feel a tension, which is, you know, on the one hand, kids and specifically younger kids really do destroy spaces. So do we want to dress our homes to the nines with young children? I mean, not all kids, but definitely my kids. My kids kind of ruined our house. (laughs) Uh, But then on the other hand, there's a time that comes in which the kids are old enough. And if the kids don't know how to find the balance between playing, having fun, living in a house, and also being respectful, it's time to teach them that. It's time to teach them where that line is. Do you have any thoughts there as a mom of three boys? Like, yes, the kids are going to grow up, but how do we, you know, find enjoyment and love in our home as our children are just rapidly growing and maturing before our eyes? Well, as far as decorating and making decorating decisions with littles, I do think there's a difference between like, I'm not going to use my glass coffee table with the sharp edges while while I have a toddler learning to walk. I think that's different than saying, oh, I have a five-year-old and he pulls stuff down and pushes things off of the coffee table. So therefore I can't have pretty, you know, I think that's a difference. And so I think there's a difference between saying I can't have my show home to the nines and I'm going to have socket covers over my plugs because I don't want my new, you know, my little crawler to to electrocute himself. The kids will grow up. Is there a moment in time where we might change things for a little bit so that our kids don't get hurt or to make our lives easier? Absolutely. I had a little kitchen in my big kitchen. I had little tables and chairs everywhere. We changed things, but it's not an excuse to say, well, when the kids go to college, then I'll have a nice house. And that's what I'm trying to say is that you do not have to, you know, my boys still enjoy a beautiful home and it represents all of us. Yeah, you said something there that's really interesting. You don't have to wait till the kids are out of the house to have that home that you have that you want or deserve even. Uh, I guess I just, for me as a mom, so my kids are 10 and 7, we're at that stage where things need to be upgraded or replaced because, <laughs> again, they did ruin all the stuff when they were younger. But I don't even know if I should because... Just yesterday, this is not a joke, just yesterday, I found them painting on a rug, like 
<laughs> no, no newspaper. They know not to paint in the house. They supposedly forgot. And so I, I guess that's just something I need to work out in my m- own mind. Like, do I wait till they're out or do I teach them, you know, how to take care of our shared space? That's 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 a personal thought. But let's move on to rule number 34. Timelessness is here to stay. I'm on board with the rule, but as somebody who, again, is not a designer, I don't know what the qualities of timelessness are. Yes. Can you help me? Well, okay. It's for the listener. As you're saying the rules, I want everyone to know that in the book, I explain the answer. So it's not like I just leave you with the rule and like, good luck with that. Like, everything I talk about is in the book explaining the answer. You're asking the questions to because we're having a conversation about it, which I love. So with timelessness is here to stay. I talk about sometimes as we are making our decisions, it can be scary if you do you know, it's, it's hard if you don't have a budget. And it's real scary. If you do have a little budget, you're like, Oh, gosh, now I have a sofa budget. And I'm terrified. Because I don't want to buy something and hate it in two years, because it was so trendy. And it's hard to know what exactly is trendy and what is timeless. And so one of the methods that I talk about in the book with when I talk about this is to teach yourself how to recognize timeless things. So for example, if you are looking for a sofa, one of the ways to get a sofa that you are sure to most likely like for a long time, maybe even keep long enough to like in 10 years, recover it. Wouldn't that be great? We keep it out of the landfill. We get a well-made sofa and it does cost a decent amount to get it recovered, but you're not like, you know, making all this trash from something like you're honoring what is there. So one of the ways to do that is by understanding what a timeless sofa style looks like. One way to do that is to look back to the past. It, you kind of can look back to the past to re- predict the future. It's just like, think about um, denim styles, jean styles. You know how like in the 1990s, we were wearing bell-bottom boot cuts. And now like Joanna Gaines, we're wearing bell-bottom boot cuts again. And now, now wide legs are coming in, you know, and there's like this cycle. However, there are certain people and there are certain styles that are kind of like, you can always kind of wear that. Like you can always wear a specific, uh, you know, Joanna Gaines is always going to wear her bootcut jeans and look great in them. So as we're talking about sofa styles, when you look at a magazine from the 1980s, when you go to Pinterest and type in family room, 1980s, 1970s, 1960s, If you can adjust your eyes away from the colors and the patterns, which is really hard (laughs) because they're crazy, but I want you to go like sofa shape hunting, silhouette or style hunting. You will begin to recognize some sofa styles that are actually timeless classics and they have names. They are Chesterfield, an English roll arm, a cabriole, a Lawson, a a tuxedo sofa. They are styles that have kind of lasted throughout the ages. They are timeless. If you look at McGee and Company, if you look at Pottery Barn, you will see these shapes. Now they're going to have a trendy fabric or they also will come in neutrals. And so I like to get a timeless sofa with a history that I can look back in the 60s and see people use, that I can look back at people in France and in other countries and they're using, that I can look back and know that this shape is sustainable. This is not like a trendy shape. Uh, that's going to go out of style. And so that is very helpful to find like a timeless sofa. Also, there are, you know, timeless, um, like tile, for example, if you're doing a backsplash or countertops, like a Carrera marble or a butcher block is a very timeless um, countertop material that you can make look good 10 years ago, 20 years ago, in 10 years and right now. Hmm. That's so helpful. Do you have any other timeless anything that could help us out? <laughs> well, I think it's helpful to find your own personal timeless classics. I'm, you know, 50 years old, so I've been around a while. I have some history with my items, but there are a few things in our home that I have loved and we've moved 15 times. So we've moved a lot, but there are, are like five or six items that I have loved in every home, no matter what the year, no matter what 
we live in a Victorian home now. We lived in a farmhouse before. We've lived in a tiny house. We've lived in all di- different homes, no matter what style, no matter what the trends were. I have a few pieces that I've always loved in my home. I've used them in different rooms. I still love them. I'm always able to work in. Those are my timeless classics. One is a white dresser. It's kind of a country style. One is a dark wood, like a mahogany Drexel 1940s dresser. That's my husband's. It's just beautiful. It's like gentlemanly. Um, I've got a brass mirror, uh, some brass lamps. And so that helps me recognize my own timeless classics. I've always loved the toile pattern and I've always loved a wing back chair. So that's like a silhouette that I am drawn to. And so I think we can each kind of pay attention and maybe be attuned to what our own personal timeless classics are. You know, we all know someone who loves maybe blue and white and their whole house is blue and white and like it works for them. doesn't matter what the trends are. Maybe people that love neutrals or whatever it is, like they're very confident in their own timeless classics. It's a really fun practice to kind of get to know yourself. Your answer there is reminding me of another interview I conducted and the person I was interviewing, her name is escaping me at the moment, but I will link to the show in the show notes for anybody interested. But essentially, my guest said, you know, we tend to have a visceral reaction to things that we like or things that we don't like. But in this case, things that we like, we say, oh, I like that. Or, oh, I like that chair. or Oh, I like that sofa. For the majority of us, we need to take that a step further and then ask ourselves, well, why? Why do I like it? What do I like about it? Sit with it and come to some conclusions. Is that what you're saying there? I am. It gives you confidence. Like when I realized, oh, I like my white dresser. It gave me confidence to know, okay, that white dresser is pretty simple. It's not ornate. It's not chippy. It's not a bright color. It's not a huge scale, but it's a small scale. I was able to use it in lots of different places. So it it teaches me maybe the type of furniture that would work really well in my situation. Someone that moves a lot, someone that likes neutrals. You know, it's so informative. For me, I'll just share this. I learned this about myself. I love furniture on little legs. (laughs) I don't know why. I (laughs) I don't know what it is. I love a good, like, big chunky piece of furniture on tiny little legs, like skinny. I don't know what it is, but I like it. I'm drawn to it. And before, I never could even have that insight. Like I just liked the whole thing. But actually what I like is the little legs. That's so good to know. That's your timeless classic. (laughs) All right. One more rule. I can't go without bringing this back, this conversation back around. The rule, of course, is the size of your house does not dictate the size of your hospitality. Yes. Well, I love to host and I have lived in a literal tiny house and we have lived in, we rented a big mansion at one point while we were shopping for a house. I think it is easy to come up with excuses. You don't have to have a big house. You don't have to own your house in order to have people over. Now, yes, if your daughter's getting married and you have 600 people attending the wedding, you might not be able to host the reception. There are some limits, but it doesn't have to limit us. You can host at the park down the street. You can host at the pizza parlor. You can host in your front yard. It doesn't have to be having the perfect house with a large family room and 10 guest rooms in order to invite your friends over and connect with them. So don't let the size of your house keep you from hosting. Yep. Don't let the size of your house, the state of your house, if it's cluttered and not cleaned up, don't let the fact that you may or may not have old 1950s mahogany furniture that's been passed down like I do stop you from entertaining. I personally have seen a trend towards not having people over, (laughs) like having fewer dinner parties, get togethers within the home. They're always tend to be out of the home because nobody wants to host. I think we need to bring hosting back because it's one thing to see your friends, family, loved ones in a restaurant. It's a whole nother thing to invite them literally and figuratively in. And so I think we all need to get better at hosting. I love to host, but I, and I know a, a lot of people don't, but maybe we host a little bit more. Myla Quinn, tell us where my listeners can connect with you, learn more about you and your work, find your new book, House Rules. Tell us all of it. Well, the book House Rules is available wherever books are sold. 
Uh, the week of launch, which comes out April 23rd, we have a pre-order bonus, like a thank you gift. And then you can go to nestor.com slash house rules to get your free gifts. But I'm on Instagram at the Nestor sharing home encouragement every day. I, I just, I see the world through house colored glasses. And I believe that every home has a silver lining. Listeners, that's a wrap. My friends, show notes are at mamaminimalist.com forward slash 452. If you loved this episode and you want more of it, please consider becoming a supporter of the show. As a supporter, you get lots of perks, but especially today, you'll get an extended and ad-free version of this episode, so more house rules for you. If you are an Apple podcast user, you can subscribe in the app and nothing will change for you. You'll get like a secret podcast feed, essentially, and you can just keep on listening to as normal. But if you listen anywhere else, you can support the show via the Substack URL in this week's show notes and ad-free and extended episodes will go straight to your inbox on the morning of release. Now, we do have an eco tip today and it comes from Nancy. Nancy wanted to share her cost and time effective action. She calls it Tylenol for her climate anxiety. I love that. Tylenol for climate anxiety. That's amazing. Uh, And so in this election year, Nancy has committed to emailing businesses and elected officials almost every day through the Climate Action Now app. The app is free and it has pre-written scripts already ready to go with the right email address. All you have to do is personalize it if you want, and then you add your name and you click send. She can send 10 emails in minutes, and Nancy believes that the more emails she sends, the more opportunities she has to get her voice out there, the better. Something with her children that she also plans to do in this election year is to start writing to voters in swing states through the Environmental Voter Project. There's also postcards to voters. There's also Vote Forward. I'll link to all of that and more in this week's show notes. But Nancy brings to light an important point, which is it's an election year. You can help get out the vote in 10 minutes or less from your home. So thank you, Nancy, for that amazing eco tip. I love it. Listeners, we'll be back on Thursday. I'll see you then. If you need me, reach out. I'm so grateful for all of you. See you Thursday and take care. When you bring your child home for the first time, you want a baby monitor you can trust. When you choose Stork, you choose technology trusted to monitor 10 million babies in hospitals every year. Stork continuously tracks your baby's pulse rate, oxygen saturation, and temperature. Visit MassimoStork.com to learn more. Stork, a revolutionary baby monitor, is born. Stork is not a medical device. Read and understand all product labeling. Massimo data on file.